Okay, welcome to session two of Dewey Decimal Classification. Thank you all for coming back for session two. To get started, let's just take a minute and review the overall agenda for all three sessions. You'll see we covered quite a bit of stuff in session one last week. And session two today, we're going to pick up kind of where we left off with subjects and disciplines. And then we're going to get started on number building, and we'll talk about the concept of number building in general, and then specifically Table 1. We'll talk about most of Table 1 today, but then we'll finish up Table 1 next week and also continue to talk about the three other tables, Tables 2, 3, and 4. So this slide should look familiar. This is where we were, the list we were working through last week. We got through the first three items, and we talked about choosing between more than one subject in the same discipline. And remember that a subject is the topic of a work, and a discipline is kind of the approach, the field, the larger field that it's approached from. And so this week we're going to talk about one or more subjects in more than one discipline. And again, we have another lovely list to go through. You'll kind of, as you get familiar with Dewey, see that there's often sort of a list of rules that you work down. If one doesn't apply, you go on to the next one. And so there are about four different things that you can look at when you're deciding between one or more subjects in more than one discipline. Sometimes there are interdisciplinary numbers that tell you to class interdisciplinary topics here. If that does not apply, then you can look at the discipline giving the fullest treatment. There is also a main class for sort of general works. And then you can always fall back to the instructions for more than one subject in the same discipline that we talked about last week. If nothing else applies, then those can apply in the situation as well. Okay, so the first thing on that list is interdisciplinary numbers. And they're basically what they sound like. There are numbers where you're specifically told to class interdisciplinary works here, that a specific number. Basically, an interdisciplinary number makes the choice for you about where to put the book if you're deciding between two disciplines. And just to make clear that we understand what the choice between two disciplines is like, remember our example from last week, I said that the subject of dogs could be approached from the discipline of zoology if you're just talking about biological aspects of dogs, or it could be approached from the discipline of animal husbandry if you're talking about having a dog as a pet. So if you had a book that addressed both of these disciplines, then you'd have to make a choice about an interdisciplinary number. And so sometimes they're provided for you. Sometimes you will see them in the relative index when you're looking up a topic, and sometimes you'll see it as you go through the schedule that it'll tell you where to class an interdisciplinary topic. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of consistency found throughout Dewey as to whether these numbers are in the relative index or the schedule. That's kind of one of the quirks of the Dewey Decimal Classification that just takes a little bit of getting used to. This will make a lot more sense when we see an example, so let's go ahead and work with a sample book here. This book is called Raising the Bar, Improving Competition Success for Professional Weightlifters Through Weight Training for Fitness, and includes materials on competitions as well as becoming fit for competitions. Now, when you're looking for interdisciplinary numbers in the relative index, there's some information about it in the introduction, in 11.8 and 11.9, so you can always go there for more information. Um, the interdisciplinary number, when you're looking through the print version, you'll see that interdisciplinary numbers are given with the unindented headings in the print version. And I have not completely reproduced a page here, but I give you kind of an example. You can see weightlifting is the heading that is not indented, and then physical fitness and sports are indented, and they each have a number next to them, but 613.7 next to the unindented heading is the interdisciplinary number. And you can see what I mean there about the schedule is kind of making the choice for you. The two options here would be deciding between 796.41 or 613.7, and 
you can tell by the fact that 613.7 is next to the unindented heading. That means the choice has been made for you, and that's an interdisciplinary number. And here's how it looks in WebDewey. It's a little bit different because there aren't any indented headings or unindented headings. But what you'll see is that there is headings that don't really have a sub-qualifier after them. They're just plain old weightlifting here, and that's the interdisciplinary number. Whereas these that have the different subheadings, those are not inter interdisciplinary numbers. Those headings that have the subheading after them are sort of the equivalent of the indented headings in the print version. So if we went ahead and clicked on that 613.7, the interdisciplinary number, or working with the print version, if you went and turned to that page, you would see this page here. And you will notice that this note here confirms what we suspected from the relative index, that you should class here interdisciplinary works on bodybuilding and weightlifting. And there will be a note explaining that. You don't have to choose, and you shouldn't choose, just from the relative index. You should always go and verify at the actual number, but there will be a note telling you that this is the interdisciplinary number. And if you scroll down, you'll see there's a note that tells us that if we were dealing with weightlifting just as a sport or bodybuilding contest, we would see 796.41. And that is the other number that we looked up in the relative index. So if we weren't sure, if we had somehow navigated here and we're looking for one that was just about sports, we would be able to get there from here. But if we click through to that 796.41, we'll see there's a note that tells us that interdisciplinary works go 613.7. So that directs us back to where we are, were originally. So there'll be notes in both directions. They'll tell you where you should class an interdisciplinary work, and if you're at a number that you shouldn't put an interdisciplinary work, it will tell you where you should put that work. So because this is an interdisciplinary work that covers not just competitions, but also weightlifting for general fitness, we're going to put it with the interdisciplinary number at 613.7. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, sometimes, like I said, Dewey is not very consistent about where the interdisciplinary numbers appear. Sometimes they're in the relative index, and sometimes they are just given in the schedules. So you'll see here's an example of a heading that does not have an interdisciplinary number. All the indented headings have numbers next to them, but the unindented one does not. And here's that same heading in the WebDewey version. There is no heading for promotion just by itself. They all have the subheadings qualifying it. So in this case, you'll still kind of want to be on the lookout for notes in the schedule that will tell you either to class here interdisciplinary works on a certain topic or to class interdisciplinary works in some other number, and it will direct you to there, and you'll have to either click through or flip over to that page if you're in the using the print version. So here's an example of that situation. Let's say we have a book called Striking Style, Costume Jewelry in the Last Century, Make Your Own. And it discusses mass production of costume jewelry in the 20th century, but it also shows you how to handcraft jewelry in the same style. So there's kind of two disciplines going on here. We have mass production of jewelry making, but also handcrafting. So if we look up jewelry in the relative index, you'll see there are 
there is a real, an interdisciplinary number just for jewelry up here. And there are also a number of subheadings. Jewelry making might be something we're interested in. Jewelry making costume jewelry in particular might be something we're interested in. So let's look up jewelry, just that first interdisciplinary number for jewelry, 391.7. We'll see that it tells you interdisciplinary works on jewelry are classed here, but this book is more specific than just jewelry. It's about jewelry making. And so there's this note that tells us to see 739.27. So if we click through to that one, You'll see there's a couple of different interdisciplinary notes here. There's one about interdisciplinary works on fine and costume jewelry. And that doesn't really apply to our situation because we're just talking about costume jewelry. And there's another one, interdisciplinary works on making costume jewelry. And our book is about making costume jewelry. And you remember that it's a couple of different aspects of it. It's got commercial production and handcrafts. So we, there's a good chance that we could be interested in this interdisciplinary number. So if we click through to that 688, we'll see, kind of want to look up the hierarchy and see that we're in the kind of manufacturing discipline here. And so we see that this is the number for commercially made, mass-produced costume jewelry. And there's no other notes that tell us that we want to go somewhere else for this interdisciplinary number. We've been directed towards this for interdisciplinary works on making costume jewelry. And so we can be pretty sure that this is correct. But you can see there's also a note here for handcrafted costume jewelry, which is the other half of this book. And so it's always a good idea to kind of check out the various notes just in case. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. And once again, this is kind of just verifying. There's a note redirecting us back to interdisciplinary works on making costume jewelry in 688. And so sometimes you'll feel kind of like you're going in circles when you're working with Dewey, but it's really just sort of verifying and making absolutely sure that things direct you back to the number that you're supposed to be at. And so I would put this book with 688 for Interdisciplinary Works on Making Costume Jewelry. Does anybody have a question about this example? Okay, so this is just a review of what we talked about with the interdisciplinary number. They are provided sometimes in the relative index and sometimes in the schedules. An important thing to remember is that you shouldn't use it if the work does not contain significant material within the discipline of that interdisciplinary number. So the one that we just did, the interdisciplinary number was mass production of costume jewelry. And so if it had been mostly about hand-making costume jewelry, then we wouldn't want to put it with that one because there wasn't a significant amount of material. It's sort of, you know, going back again to the rule of fuller treatment. But it's just something to keep in mind when you're working with interdisciplinary numbers. Okay, so we're going back to our list that we started with at the beginning of the session of what to do when you have more than one subjects in more than one discipline. And if there isn't an interdisciplinary number that works for you, then you will go with the discipline given the fullest treatment. And this is basically the same thing as the rule of fuller treatment we discussed last time when we were talking about 
more than one subject in the same discipline. If the book is mostly about one of two disciplines, then you go with that one. So here's an example called Fighting for Home Birth. It discusses Nebraska's legal stance in regard to midwifery, custom of childbirth at home, and describes the practice of midwifery. And you can see from the numbers of pages there that the practice of midwifery is the fullest treated topic in this book. And so we'll look up the three different topics. We won't go through the whole process of how we get there, but the legal aspects of midwifery are covered in medical law at 344.04. The customs of birth at home are covered in 392.1. And midwifery itself is under obstetrics at 618.2. And like we said, this one's pretty simple because there's obviously more material about midwifery itself. So we're going to use the number for obstetrics, 618.2. The next option that you might occasionally see, probably not very often, is the main class and the zeros for computers, information, and general works. There are in particular a couple of areas that you might use. The 060 is for general organizations and museology, and the 080 is for collections of works. Here's the 060. And this applies to organizations whose activity is not limited to a specific field or works about organizations in general. So, example, you know, if just a book about how organizations are run, Robert's Rule of Order, things like that, it would probably go in this class. And you can see this is broken down geographically. And here's that you might use slightly more often if you're looking for an interdisciplinary number is the 080 class. And this is for general collections of things, essays, something like that, that don't fall under a certain topic. If it's something that's under a particular topic, you'll class it with the number for that topic. But if it's just kind of a broad collection, you'll probably put it here. Um, for example, one of the things I noticed that Lincoln City Libraries has classed at 081 is collections of stories from the National Story Project, and there's no particular topic that they can tie it to, so it just goes in general collections in American English. And you'll see that these collections are broken down by language. So like I said, you probably won't see these two options that often, but it's something to keep in mind. And then, if all else fails, when you're dealing with more than one discipline, you can fall back to the instructions that we talked about last week for more than one subject in the same discipline. The rule of fuller treatment, the first to two rule, the rule of three, the rule of zero, and the rule of application. Does anybody have any questions about more than one subject in more than one discipline? Okay, then we will go on. Now, we're going back to our list of classifying with the DDC, Section 5 of the Introduction. And the last thing on that list is called the Table of Last Resort. And it's pretty much just what it sounds like. It's what you use if all else fails. If none of this other stuff applies and you really need help making a decision between two topics, you go with the Table of Last Resort. It's used when more than one number seems to be applicable, and it, it really should be used as a last resort. They tell you to use with caution and consider the intent of the author when you're trying to decide between two of these things. But that bulleted list there is basically, I reproduced the table of last resort, and what it is is a table of preference. You'll want to get used to the idea of a table of preference when you're working with Dewey, and that means just a list and things at the top of the list 
you prefer those over things at the bottom of the list. So if you're choosing between two of those, trying to figure out where to class something, you will always choose things at the top of the table before things at the bottom. So that's what this is. This is a table of preference. And sometimes when the schedules tell you which number to use, it's based on this table. A lot of times the work of the table of last resort has already done for you, so you won't have to think about it this much. But you can see, for example, if you're working with something that is a kind of thing rather than a process by which something is made, you will, you'll choose the kind of thing before choosing the process. And this all is sort of abstract, but it makes a little bit more sense when you look at an example. If you had a book about embroidered rugs, for example, you would classify it with the number for rugs rather than the number for embroidery, because a rug is a kind of thing, which was the very first topic in that table of last resort, and embroidery is a process which comes later down in the table. And actually, this is a case in which the schedules itself tells you to do this. You can see that there's a table of preference here at the bottom of this, this page, and it tells you that rugs are preferred over needlework and handwork. And basically that's based off of the table of last resort. A kind of thing, a rug, is preferred to a, pref a process, embroidery or needlework. So we made it through this whole list, classifying with the DDC. Does anybody have any questions about this, about any of those things that we've talked about? We're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about number building. Okay, um, the idea of number building is a very important concept for the Dewey Decimal Classification. You know, you can look up your topics in the relative index, but then there's also number building used to further subdivide your topics. And basically it's used to group like items with like items. It's helped to organize a larger number of items within a topic and to define more facets of an item. So I mean, if you have a collection that doesn't have very many items, it's not as important. You know, people can probably browse and find what they want, but especially in a larger collection, it's important to be able to break down numbers into longer numbers with more subdivisions that help subdivide your topic. It helps your patrons find what they need more easily. And what we're going to talk about first is adding numbers as directed in the schedule, and then we'll move on to talk about tables, which are also a form of number building. And it's really just a matter of following instructions as you find them in the schedule. Sometimes you'll add numbers from another class or division before adding the subdivision. Let's look at an example. If we have a book called Handbook for Casting Steel, we'll browse for steel in the relative index. And casting steel is a type of metalworking, so we will look at 672. And you'll see that 672 is the number for iron, steel, and other iron alloys, including metalworking processes. There's a note right here that says metalworking processes are included, but it doesn't tell us particularly which number to use for each process. Casting is a particular type of process. And you'll see that there are instructions specifically for building a number that will tell us that we're working with casting steel. If you add to the base number 672, the number is following 671. Now when you first encounter a direction like this, it kind of seems like it's sending you on a wild goose chase all around the Dewey schedules, but it's actually a convenient reuse of the pattern under 671. You know, it, as you get used to working with Dewey, you'll find out there are often patterns that kind of pop up, and it saves space by not having to repeat the same patterns under each and every number. 
So we know that if we click on the 671.2 through 671.8, it's going to give us more information about how to build a number for casting steel. But before I do that, I would go ahead and write down our base number, 672, so that this way you remember the track that you're on. You know that we're working with 672, the number for steel. And so we'll go ahead and click through to the 671.2 range of numbers here for specific metal working processes. And we want to see more specifically if casting is listed, so we're going to click on that link. And it is. 671.2 is this number for casting. And there are no further subdivisions or instructions if we go ahead and click on that link. And remember our instructions told us to add to the number 672. We're supposed to add the number after the decimal point in 671. So we're going to go ahead and put this at 672.2. I know that number building can be kind of confusing at first. Does anybody have any questions about how that example worked? Okay, here's another example of number building directions that you will find directly in the schedule. Um, let's see. If we're looking to classify a book on either freshwater fishes or marine fishes, we would go here to this number. For both of these options, freshwater fishes and marine fishes, the number building has already been done. And you'll see that sometimes in the schedule. The building of the numbers will actually have been done, but they'll also include the directions on how to do it, just so you know where they're coming from. So even though these numbers are created for us, we'll go ahead and work through the process so we know how they got there. So the numbers we're looking at here are the 597.176 and 597.177. They're already created, but the note here tells you that they were created by following these instructions. We add to base number 597.1 the numbers following 591 in that range of numbers. And notice this is a little bit different from last time. Last time they just gave us the base number that was the three digits before the decimal point, the 672, but this time we're supposed to include the point 0.1 after the decimal point. So I would go ahead and write down the base number 597.1 so that I didn't forget what my base number was and that it included a decimal this time. And then click on that range of numbers that gives us the instructions. So the number we're looking at is 591.7, Animal Characteristics of a Specific Environment. And if we click on that, there are subdivisions for specific environments. And if we click on that last link there, we get aquatic animals and marine animals, which is freshwater animals or marine animals. And again, these numbers are built for us. But there is also a note telling us how they were built. There's sort of two levels of number building going on in this example. And if you click on that range of numbers, you'll see that 6 is for freshwater ecology and 0.7 is for marine ecology. And so I know that's quite the trail we just went on there. So here's a summary of the number building we just did. We added to the base number. We started with our base number 597.1. And we added the numbers following 591 in that range of numbers. And then we added... To, we got those numbers by adding to a base number 591.7, the numbers following 577. So we did a couple of jumping arounds looking for numbers, and we ended up with, for example, for freshwater fish, 597.176, which, like I said, was already built for us. So if you were navigating the schedules, you wouldn't necessarily have to do this, but 
it's good to kind of know where they're coming from. Any questions about number building using the schedules? Okay, I have a request coming in to just see that again. I'm assuming you mean this last example about the fishes. We can go through that really quickly. Okay, so we're working on a book about either freshwater fishes or marine fishes. I don't have a specific title for this example, but... We've navigated to the area for 597.1, General Topics in Natural History of Cold Bird Vertebrates. And the numbers are already built for us, but we're going to pretend like they aren't. And we're going to read these directions down here that tells us to add to base number 597.1, the numbers following 591. So I would write down 597.1 to keep in mind that that is your base number, and that's what we're going to add on to. And then we're going to jump to 591 in the schedules. So if you're using Web Dewey, you just click on that link. If you're using the print version, you flip over to that page. And so what this page tells us that we're looking for a number in this range to add to our 597.1. And we're looking to describe our freshwater fish, which is a specific type of environment. It's a, we're talking particularly about the freshwater environment. So that tells us that 591.7 is an, or the 0.7. We're looking, you know, it tells us to add the number after 591. So 0.7 is what we're going to add to our number that we're building. So at this point, if you were writing down you could go ahead and add on to the number you're building and you would have 597.17. But when we click through, we see that we can do a little bit more specifically. We can add on another number. And if you click through to that link, the specific factors affecting ecology, specific environments, you'll see that the subdivisions are broken down more to aquatic animals, which means freshwater animals, or marine animals, which means animals that live in the ocean. And again, the number is built for us. If we wanted to go ahead and select it, we could choose aquatic animals, and we'd add a 6 onto our number that we're building and call it good for freshwater fishes. But it, again, there's instructions here that tell you how to do it. So you add to 591.7 the numbers following 577. So again, we're going to make another jump, click through that link, or flip through the page if we're doing the print version. And again, you'll see the 0.6 or the 0.7 is a choice between freshwater ecology and marine ecology. And if we're going with freshwater fishes, that 6 is the number that we're looking at. We want to add that on to the number we've already been building, which up to this point was 597.17. So our full number is 597.176. I know this is a really complicated answer to wrap your brain around to begin with. And like I said, you won't necessarily have to do anything that complicated because they're already built for you in the schedules, but this is kind of an example. Okay, I have a question coming in that says, are there any rules or guidelines for how short or how far out the number has to go? And that really depends on your local collection. Um, one of the things, you know, we're working with a bridge Dewey here, and a lot of times you can only go so far with a bridge Dewey. They just don't have the subdivisions that the full number, the full version of Dewey has. And the reason for that is because if it's a smaller collection, you don't need such a long number, so many subdivisions. So there aren't really any rules or guidelines. It just depends on your own collection. And if you have a lot of books on, to keep using the same example, if you have a lot of books on dogs and you think that your patrons will find it easier if you break it down by different breeds of dogs, for example, then you can choose to the extend the number 
and use the subdivisions for different breeds. But if you just have maybe 10, 12 books on dogs and you think that they'll be easily browsable, you can just go ahead and use the number for dogs without using the subdivisions. And so it really is a local decision about as how far out you want to go. It just depends on how detailed your collection is in that particular area. Does that answer your question on that? Great. Okay, so we've been talking so far about number building using the schedules themselves, but there are also, as I mentioned, four tables. And standard subdivisions are the table one, which we're going to talk about today. And like I said, adding subdivisions helps patrons browse the shelves by keeping like items together. They're more helpful when you have a large number of items on one subject. As I've sort of been saying all along, if you have 10 books on a particular topic, you can browse them easily and you may not need to add subdivisions. But if you have 100 books, it becomes harder. So if you have 10 books about dogs, it's easy to classify them. But if you have 100 books, you might want to put all the encyclopedias about dogs together or all the dogs from a historical approach together. And the standard subdivisions help you do that. You're not required to add them, but it helps you organize your collection a little bit more if you want to go ahead and add them. So the tables um, help you classify by a, a certain number of facets, different ways of organizing it. You can organize them by format. There are subdivisions for dictionaries, serials, catalogs, etc. The approach or the viewpoint of the author. There are different subdivisions for people, location, literary forms, and use of language. As I said before, there, the source of the subdivisions and the instructions for working with them come from the tables. There are only four tables in the abridged version that we're going to be working with. There are six ones in the full Dewey. There are sometimes instructions about how to add these subdivisions in the schedules. And you can find out more about them in the introduction, section 8.1 through 8.18. And the manual does have some instructions for using these as well. I just wanted to point out where to find them in Web Dewey. You know, they're pretty easy to find in the print version because you can just look up in the table of contents and it says tables. But you might not know where to look in Web Dewey. So when you first log in to Web Dewey, you get the search screen. And you can click on tables down here in order to get to the tables. There also will obviously be links to the tables when you encounter the, the appropriate parts in the schedules. But if you want to just log in and look at the tables, that's where you find them. You'll see there's four of them, like I mentioned. Table 1 has the standard subdivisions. Table 2 is for geographic areas and persons and can only be used in conjunction with Table 1. We'll talk about that next week. Table 3 is for literature and can only be used with numbers in the 800s. And Table 4 is for languages and can only be used with numbers in the 400s. And we'll talk about all those except for Table 1 next week. So today, let's focus on Table 1. There are a number of different facets that are included in Table 1. You can subdivide by format, by approach, people, and location. We'll talk about the first three of those today, and we're going to leave location for next week because you have to work with Table 2 as well when you're talking about location. So here is Table 1. All of the standard subdivisions are listed starting with 0 in Table 1. And there's a table of preference. Remember I told you table of preference is a concept you're going to want to get used to. And in the standard subdivisions is one area in which the, t the idea of a table of preference will apply. And that will tell you the order in which you should choose subdivisions if more than one could apply. Generally, you only use one standard subdivision unless the instructions for a particular number tell you to do differently. So if you have something that's a serial publication but it's also an encyclopedia, you have to choose between the two of them. You can't add subdivisions for both of them. So from the main table one screen, you can click on any of those subdivisions to see them in more detail. For example, if you clicked on the O2, you'll see that 
022, 023, various ways in which this standard subdivision is subdivided even further. And the hierarchy continues. It can get subdivided even further. So generally, you can use standard subdivisions at any time. If you feel that one is necessary, you can go ahead and add it to a number directly. Unless the schedules explicitly forbid it, there are a few numbers where they say you can't use standard subdivisions. Unless the topic of the item is only part of the number, we'll see examples of this, they'll make more sense. There might be certain restrictions specified in the schedules, or if it would be redundant, if the number for some reason already includes that aspect of the subdivision, and it would just be redundant to add that subdivision. So here's an example in which it would be for it would be redundant. You can see that normally 028 is the standard subdivision for auxiliary techniques and procedures or equipment and materials, but that is already covered. The, almost the exact same phrasing is used under 522, and you'll see that because this number 028 is in brackets, that means that it is forbidden. It's not used if it's in brackets. And just in case you don't catch that, there's also a note telling you do not use this number, class it in 522. Here is an example of an including note, a note where the topic you're trying to class isn't the whole topic for the number, and so therefore you can't use standard subdivisions. For example, we have the topic of optical engineering that includes a number of different smaller topics. You know, there's a whole including note here that says there are a number of topics under here. So if we have a book that's just about lasers, because lasers is not the whole topic, because optical engineering is the larger topic, we cannot use standard subdivisions on lasers. It's the same thing here. This is a screenshot from the full Dewey. And see, so the reason behind why you can't use standard subdivisions on some of these including topics is because in full Dewey, they each have their own number. In full Dewey, there is a specific number for lasers, and you can add standard subdivisions to that number. But in a bridge Dewey, you cannot add standard subdivisions to that larger number. And sometimes there'll be notes that tell you when you can and can't use standard subdivisions, as in this case. This 153.3 number includes three different topics, imagination, imagery, and creativity. And you'll see that, that note Sometimes these notes get very specific, but you can use standard subdivisions if you're talking about all three of those together, or for imagination alone. But if you're talking just about imagery, you can't use these standard subdivisions. Let's see, I see we have another question. There's a question wondering if OCLC connection is the full or abridged Dewey, and the answer is that there are both full and abridged versions available for Web Dewey on OCLC connection. The one that we are using here, the login that I gave you for class, is the abridged version, and you can see the difference when you log in and you go to Dewey services, abridged Web Dewey shows up here. Now we do have access at the commission to the full Web Dewey version as well, and so that's what I used when I created this screenshot. I logged in for the full one, and you'll see it just says Web Dewey, not abridged Web Dewey. So OCLC Connection provides access to both, and it just depends on which one your library chooses to subscribe to, just like your library can choose to buy the print version for either the full or the abridged version. That's a good question, though. Sometimes when you're going through the schedules, you'll see that instead of using a standard subdivision, the same number is built into the base number. For example, in this case, 
Let's see. Oh, I see we have another question coming in. What is best to use? I'm sh assuming that's a question about whether abridged versus full is best to use. And it really depends on your own collection. I think the cutoff that I've usually heard is that abridged Dewey works well for collections with under 20,000 nonfiction titles. And if you have a larger collection of over 20,000, you'll probably want to use the full version. But it really just kind of depends on your local collection and how specific you need to get. The advantage of using the full version is that you'll have more subdivisions available to you and you can make longer numbers that are more specific and help your patrons browse your collection if it's kind of large. So in general, larger collections would probably benefit more from the full version and 20,000 is the cutoff that I've generally heard, though of course that's not a hard and fast rule, it's just kind of a rule of thumb. So again, in this example, you'll see 103 is already built, and it, it is for dictionaries and encyclopedias. Generally, the standard subdivision would be to add a .03 onto something, but in this case, it's already built, so it would be redundant. You wouldn't put 103.03 .03 because that has already been built for you. Now, sometimes you'll see variations in adding subdivisions. Generally, you just, you'll see in the table they all begin with 0, and so you'll just add 0, 1 or 0, 2 to the number. So, But there are a number of different variations you can go through. Sometimes you add them as they are in the table. Sometimes you drop the lead 0 after an existing 0. Sometimes you retain that 0, and there are two zeros in there. And sometimes you can even add an extra 0. And these depend on notes in the schedule. If you're just adding from the table, you'll add the 0, 1 or 0, 2 or whatever. But sometimes you'll see notes that tell you that the standard subdivisions are handled a little bit differently. And we'll go through and look at some examples of these. Let's say we have the Encyclopedia of Fruit and explores many varieties of fruit, their agricultural development and history, where they are and how they're grown. So we look up fruit in the relative index and we're directed to orchards, fruits, and forestry. And remember just to look at the notes to see if it tells you anything about standard subdivisions. And this it tells you it's for added for all three together or for orchards alone or for fruits alone. And we have fruits alone in this example so we can go ahead and add standard subdivisions. So the number for fruit is 634. We'll go ahead and write that down. And then we look at Table 1 for standard subdivisions. Remember, we're looking for encyclopedias. And I also should point out at this point that you don't have to just browse the tables like this. You can look up, for example, encyclopedias in the relative index. And if you see a number in the relative index with T1 or T2 in front of it, it means that it's directing you to the one of the tables. So we look up encyclopedias and we see that it's included in 03 and there aren't any further subdivisions so the number for this encyclopedia of fruit is 634.03 and that's an example of a subdivision that is added directly how it appears in the table now this example should look familiar it's the one we kind of did halfway last week about the media's influence on children and we got to the number 302.23 but we did not add the subdivision for indicating that it's about children. So this is the number we got to, 302.23 and we see that, that number expands a little bit, 302.2308 is for respect to kinds of persons. And how they got the number is that they partially built the number already for us using the table. Table 1, you will see that 08 is the standard subdivision for history and description with respect to kinds of persons. And since we're children are a kind of person, they've already built this number a little bit for us. But there are some subdivisions under 08. And you'll see that they are listed under... 081 through 088 for specific kinds of persons. 
If we click on that, we see that young people are at 083. If we click on that, we look at the notes and see that children are included here. And so our full number for this is 302.23083. The 08 indicates that we're talking about media's influence on a specific, specific set of persons, and the 083 in particular is for children. Now there are, like we said, some variations. You can sometimes drop the lead zero. You don't always have to insert 03. You could just put 0.3. And this usually happens when you're working with a number that already ends in a zero. Here's, and a lot of times, rather than these appearing through instructions, you'll see that the numbers are already built. In this case, the zero from science, the 500, has already been dropped to create 501. Here's an example of that. Let's say we have a serial publication called the Isaac Asimov Yearbook of Astronomy. And let's take a look at the print version really quick here. Let's see. Oh, I'm seeing we have a hand raised. Okay, I have unmuted your microphone. If you want to go ahead and ask your question. I was just wondering, on that last example, when it was ending in 0 .03 on the table, it was 0 .030. Do you have to put the last zero in past the three, or? That's a good question. Let me go back and look at that example. Was this the screen you're looking at, Barb? Uh, no. Let's see. I think that I'm let's see. Not seeing anything back. I it was back. Oh, yeah, it was the one before that. This one? No, I think it was on your last example. Oh, the example before that? The one yeah, about... It, yeah, and it showed this one, and when you went... Yeah, that... Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's uh, see. Yeah, see, it says point zero three zero, and then when you put it in, it was point zero three. So Let's do you see. need that last zero? Um, we're actually... The subdivision we're looking at here is the point zero three. Um, is this what you're look seeing? This point zero three zero. Uh huh. Okay, that is telling us specifically interdisciplinary encyclopedias. If there was more than one topic, and ours is very narrowly oh, okay. focused on fruits, so we were just to go with point zero three on this one. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, let me get back to where we were here. Okay, so we are looking at the print version of the schedules here. Sometimes there are certain things about print Dewey that's a little bit easier to navigate, and this is kind of one of them that I think might be true. Sometimes directions for adding standard subdivisions can be found in the summary in the schedules. So. Under 520, you'll see that it tells you standard subdivisions are 0.1 through 0.9. And this is the difference from the usual procedure. Normally it would be 0.01 through 0.09, but these are handled a little bit differently in this number, and this is how it will show up in the print schedules. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite as clear in WebDewey. If we click on 520, you'll see that it gives the examples for 520.1 and 520.2. And you can see from the descriptions, once you get used to working with Table 1, you'll see that philosophy and theory and miscellany are 0 .01 and 0 .02 in the Table 1. 
but it doesn't just give you a nice concise note that says to you is point one through point nine. It's you're supposed to kind of pick up on the pattern and realize that we're using point one through point nine instead of zero point and point zero one through point zero nine. So and this doesn't appear all the time, but yet there are some areas in which I feel that navigating web Dewey kind of assumes a basic familiarity with Dewey in general that isn't always assumed in the print version. So that's just something to keep in mind. So here's our example again. The number for astronomy is 520. And your book means it's published annually, so it's a serial publication. We need to find the subdivision for a serial publication. And let's go back to table one. Serials are under 0 0.05. And if we click on that, we'll see that yearbooks are given under the notes, so we know we're in the right area. And normally, you would add the subdivision 0 0.05, but remember we're working off of the different pattern that was given in the notes. So it's going to be 520.5, not 520.05. Anybody have any question on that example? OK, sometimes a different pattern that you might always see is that you don't drop the zero after an existing zero. That's you know, not a hard and fast rule across the board. Here is the Manual of Research Statistics for Chemical Engineers. And unfortunately, I'm going to kind of go through these last examples kind of quickly, because I do want to get time to talk about the assignment. So we look up chemical engineering, and we'll see it's at 660. And again, the pattern for standard subdivisions is given. You know, we have 0 0.01, 0 0.02, and then they give the rest. This time they do give the rest of the standard subdivisions for you, so you don't have to completely recognize the pattern on your own. And so we know it's going to be 660, and according to the pattern, there will be a zero there. Research is under 0 0.07, and more specifically, 0 0.072. And there are no further instructions that direct us anywhere else. So this is going to go at 660.072. See, we have some more questions coming in. Let's see. For astronomy, asking a question about the astronomy example, you won't know to drop the zero unless you looked at the print version. It's not entirely correct. You just have to kind of infer. Let me go back to that astronomy example. Now with the print version, they spell it out for you all of the standard subdivisions, 0 0.1 through 0 0.9. In the web version, it's not as clear, but it is there. Under 520, they sort of start building the standard subdivisions for you, that it's 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, and they don't continue on to give you the rest of the standard subdivisions. So you just kind of had to be on the lookout for something like this it means to drop the zero. And as you get used to using the standard subdivisions, you'll realize that philosophy and theory is the first standard subdivision, and miscellany is the second standard subdivision. So when you start to see terms like that, you'll recognize that this is a pattern you should pay attention to, and that it kind of implies that the rest of the standard subdivisions follow. But it's not as clear as it is in the print version. Does that answer your question? So you have to kind of be familiar enough with Dewey to infer that when you see a point 0.1 and point 0.2, it can be assumed that point 0.3 through point 0.9 also follow suit for the standard subdivisions instead of point 0 0.01 or point 0 0.02 or point 0 0.03. I know it sounds really tricky to wrap your head around right now, and but believe me, you will get more comfortable with it as you go along. And it's not as common. I just, you know, I wanted to mention it as something that you should look out for, but as we saw with the other example, all the standard subdivisions were given. So it's another one of the mysteries of Dewey that I can't completely explain why they 
didn't always go through and write them all out, but there it is. So let's get back. We finished our chemical engineering example. And sometimes it can go the opposite direction. You can even add an extra zero that you wouldn't know you would need. And this will be given in the schedule. You'll see that they give the pattern 4.001, 002, and the rest of the standard subdivisions. So under this topic of small firearms, you add an extra zero. And I touched on this briefly before, but if you have multiple facets that you could bring out, you're only supposed to add one standard subdivision, and you use the table of preference for this. And once in a while you'll see instructions in the schedules that tell you it's okay to use multiple subdivisions, but probably 95% of the time you can only use one. And so, for example, so here's that table of preference again, and it's pretty long. But remember, choose ones closer to the top before ones closer to the bottom. For example, if you had an encyclopedia that was also a serial publication, you would see that the subdivision for encyclopedias comes before serial publications in the table of preference. So you would add 03 for encyclopedias rather than something in the 05s for a serial publication. Okay, there's a question that has come in about classifying books as theory. That sounds like a fairly specific question, Shirley. Would you mind emailing, or I'll get back to you about that one, about email when we're done. We're really getting kind of pressed on time here, and I do want to make sure we get time to go through the assignment. So and that sounds like a very specific to your situation, Shirley. So I will handle that one via email afterwards. So here is the class webpage again, and I believe that this URL should be working. I think I heard word this morning that our website is up and running. So you can go to this URL, but if it doesn't work for some reason, you can substitute nlc.nebraska.gov at the beginning, the link that I sent you out in the email yesterday, and that should work. The assignment is up there. The recording will be up there shortly, and it is due by 8 a.m. next Tuesday. Next session is June 22nd, next Tuesday. The handouts will be available on the web again, and we'll talk more about number building. Okay, I am going to pull up Web Dewey really quick here, and we will talk about the assignment. Perhaps. Okay, so the first item on the assignment was a book called Odds On, Betting at the Horse Track. And most of you, I think, were pretty close on this one. What I did to find this one was I chose to browse in the relative index for horse racing. Oh, and I see that I missed a question going back here. Do you ever end with a zero after the decimal? Um, no, you won't ever see that.
Okay, so we're looking at horse racing. We see that we clicked through to 798. Uh, and of course, this is not cooperating. <laughs> it logged me off. But that's okay. We'll start over. This is always the fun part of doing live demonstrations in class. You hope everything will work. We will look for horse racing again. Click through 798.4. And you can see that betting is a subdivision under here. And so I would put this book at 798.401. It didn't seem like too many of you had problems with this one. The next question was pre-adult developmental psychology. And I started by browsing for developmental psychology in the relative index. And it directed me to 155. And we're looking at pre-adult psychology. So we are talking about age groups from birth to 18. So I went to the range of psychology for specific ages. And I think most of you got into this range. And from then it was a question of this is dealing with from birth to 18. So it does involve both child psychology and psychology of young people 12 to 20. So what I did in this situation was I applied the first of two rule. We were deciding between 155.4 and 155.5, and so there weren't any notes that directed otherwise, so I went with Now the third question was about current religions of the Middle East. It discusses Islam, Hinduism, and Judaism. So what I started was by looking for each of those individual religions in the relative index. And Islam is at 297. And I kind of just wrote down these numbers as I went through, just keeping track of them. Hinduism was at 294.5. And Judaism was at 296. So they're all in the 290s. So in this case, I applied the rule of three and went up to the first level of the hierarchy that includes all of these religions. So I put it at 290. Okay, the third or fourth one was successful second grade readers containing information about whole language, oral reading, and evaluating reading skills. So I think I started out by looking for reading in the relative index. And we're talking about second graders. So I went for reading elementary education, which directed us to 372.4. And you can see under the subdivisions, some of our topics are here, but not all of them. Evaluation of reading skills, for example, has its own subdivision, 372.48. And this is a situation in which you were, if you were using the print version, you could probably just kind of browse and see what the various things included under each of these topics are. But using WebDewey, it might be better to kind of look for the relative index or even do a search options and search for whole language, perhaps. And you'll see that it directs us to reading comprehension strategies, which is another subdivision under 372.4. And then oral reading was our other one.
And then it just kind of shows you have to kind of use a couple of different options if you don't originally find what you're looking for. So reading skill strategies includes oral reading. And this is also, so all three of them are subdivisions under reading. And so you might think that you would use the rule of three again and go up one level in the hierarchy. And that would be the case, except remember you always have to look for other directions that tell you to do something different. So under this one it says, unless other instructions are given, class a subject with aspects of two or more subdivisions in the number coming last. So in this case, we're going to go with 372.48, which is the number coming last out of all of those. Now the next one was mathematical transformation of map making. It discusses the influence of mathematical theory on current cartographic practices. And remember, in this case, there is a rule called the rule of application, which means that you class things with the topic that's being acted on or influenced rather than the one that's doing the influence. And if I can spell here. So cartography is what's being influenced here. Math is doing the influencing. So I looked up cartography, and it goes in 526. And you might also want to look up general mathematics just to make sure that there aren't any instructions that tell you to do otherwise. But And so I did in that case, and there weren't. So you'll see here that cartography, map drawing, and map making are all classed here. I did see that some people had put down 912 because they were kind of, if you look up maps in the relative index, it directs you to 912. But in this case, there is a note directing you to 526 for map drawing and map making. So that's what I would have followed to get here if I had looked up maps in the relative index. Now this last one was probably the most confusing one. What I did on this one is I looked up paintings in the relative index and got to the 750s. And now we have both a historical and a geographic treatment of this one. It's historical because it's the Victorians period, but it is geographic because we're treating it as British because it's an emphasis on British. And you'll see there's a note here that tells us do not use. We should class this in 759. So we're following that note. And again, we're choosing between periods of development and geographic treatment. And a number of people went with 759.2 because they clicked on Europe. And then 759.2 was the number for the British Isles. The answer that I based mine on was 759.05, and the note that I was working off was, was if you go in the 759, there's a note that says class Western painting of one or two specific periods in this range, and this is the time period here. And basically, the way I interpreted this note is with telling us that if you're only working with one or two specific time periods, then the time period is more important than the geographic area, and so that's why it would go here. A number of people, like I said, went with 759.2 for British Isles. And I think that what it was coming down to was a difference of interpretation of this note here. Class your schools and styles not limited by country or locality works on one or two periods of European painting. And the way I interpreted the note was because of this works on one or two periods of European painting, this should go here because it's on one period of British painting, which is a subset of European painting. I had a couple of people who interpreted this to mean that European, in the sense, meant that all of Europe is covered in this book. And if it's one specific country or locality, then it should go with 759.2 for British. And I see the argument there. I think that's a valid argument. You made me sort of at least reconsider the fact that maybe this isn't the best example to use for people newly navigating Dewey. And so this does illustrate the fact that when it comes down to it, in some situations, choosing a classification number is catalogers' judgment. You make a call based on what you think the notes mean, and also based on what works best in your collection. You know, it's kind of an artificial exercise in this class because we have a title of a book. We don't even have the whole book in front of us, so it's hard to see 
what the book is actually about. We're working off of a title. And not only that, but we don't have a whole collection to place it with. In this case, you would probably look and see what the other books about British Victorian painting were based, were classed at in your collection. And so you make a decision using a larger context than what we have here. So my interpretation of this note is still that this should be classed at 759.05, but I can see where the 759.2 people are coming from. That's sort of a conclusion I've come to over the course of the week. And so if I responded to your assignment in the beginning of the week and said that 759.2 was wrong, I think I remember reconsidering that a little bit. So again, this is just sort of the illustration of the fact that it's not completely cut and dried using Dewey. There's not always a completely right or completely wrong answer, and it really depends on your local collection. Does anybody have any questions about this question or any of the rest of the assignment? Okay, well in that case, I thank you all for coming, and your assignment will be up on the class webpage shortly, and so will the recording. And if there are no further questions, I will see you back here next week. Thank you.